When you hear a food described as creamy, lush, or decadent, what do you think of? Whatever it is, it's probably not vegetables. But vegetables deserve to be so much more than crispy or fresh, and unlocking their true potential is as simple as overcooking them. Before we can get to why overcooked vegetables can be really great, we need to understand the composition of raw vegetables and what happens to them when they're cooked. Broadly speaking, the plant cells we're looking at today have semi-rigid walls that are held together with a cement that contains hemicellulose and pectin. Within each of those cells are large watery vacuoles that contain the compounds a plant needs to do its thing, things like enzymes, sugars, proteins, acids. Those compounds are also responsible for a plant's flavor. Raw vegetables are crisp or tender, soft or chewy, because of how strong the cement is holding those cells together and how full their vacuoles are. Large full vacuoles press against those cell walls, keeping the plant rigid. Cooking disrupts all of this, and that can be a great thing. So what I did here, blanching these green beans, keeps them fresh and green. And it's a technique, among a couple of others, that really took off in the 80s and 90s. All of this was in response to the way many Americans were cooking vegetables in the 50s and 60s, kind of cooking them a lot, like a lot, lot, till they got kind of brown and soft, mushy. Here's the thing, overcooking doesn't have to be bad. Extending the cooking time can make vegetables creamy, extra flavorful, luscious. And this isn't a new technique either. Cooks across the world have been doing this for centuries. But how can overcooking take your vegetables to the next level? First up, let's look at tenderization. Right here, I have Annie Petito's Wakaway Ratatouille. It's a vegetable stew from Provence, and it's a showcase of just how great tender vegetables can be. Now to get to this date, I sauteed aromatics and then threw in chunks of eggplant. And then this whole pot went into the oven and roasted for 40, 45 minutes at 400 degrees. The goal during that cook time was to get the hemicellulose and pectin holding the eggplant cells together to dissolve and break down. At this point, I can just mush this eggplant down. Ooh, hello. And it just kind of falls apart because there is nothing holding those cells together anymore. I kind of prefer a masher that has a perforated disc at the bottom as opposed to the ones with the little squiggle. I find I don't have to chase as many things around and it just works faster. Now in a lot of ratatouilles, the vegetables are mixed together and cooked together. And what that can lead to is eggplant that's maybe slimy or stringy or mushy, spongy, but that's not the case with this eggplant. Now that I'm done breaking down the eggplant, I'm gonna fold in zucchini and bell pepper, toss this back in the oven, but it's only gonna roast for another 20 minutes. I'm doing that because I want the zucchini and bell pepper to become tender but to not fully lose their structure. And then we're gonna see just how great tender vegetables can be. So here's my finished ratatouille, and it is looking fantastic. That eggplant that we slow roasted has fully broken down. The hemicellulose and pectin holding its cells together have dissolved, and it's left us with this creamy, luscious sauce, kind of the way eggplant gets in baba ganoush. And it gets that way because we've cooked it for three times as long as the other vegetables. That keeps some of our vegetables delicate and tender while turning our eggplant into a beautiful sauce. All right, enough talking, it's time to taste. So this is great as a side dish, but it's also pretty fantastic as just a vegetable entree, maybe a salad, some bread, it's delicious. I'm gonna finish this with a sprinkle of basil and a nice drizzle of extra virgin olive oil. Mm. That eggplant is so creamy and silky. It's amazing. It coats the vegetables and it's delivering all the aromatics and herbs that we cooked into this dish at the beginning. Oh, this is so good. No, gotta stop eating, gotta keep talking. In fact, overcooking can help vegetables absorb flavor. Like I'm gonna absorb this ratatouille. I am making Andrew Janjigian's Mediterranean braised green beans. And what's interesting about this braise is it doesn't work like a meat braise. When you're braising meat, you can expect juices from the meat to leach out and flavor the braising liquid. The flavors in that braising liquid, they don't really penetrate the meat. 
That's not the way green beans work. Here, we can expect the beans to absorb flavor. Now, I've got onions and garlic that I've sauteed, a little bit of water in here. I'm going to add my green beans and I want them to cook, but to help them break down, I'm also gonna add a little bit of baking soda. The reason I've added baking soda to this cooking liquid is I want to raise the pH of the water. Under those alkaline conditions, the hemicellulose holding our green bean cells together, it's gonna to start to dissolve. That opens them up and allows them to absorb flavor. It's been 10 minutes and the baking soda has done its job. It's helped the green beans become tender. What I need to do now is to stop that soda. I don't want these green beans to turn to mush. I'm going to do that by neutralizing the baking soda with acidic tomatoes. I'm gonna to add a couple of other flavorings to help these beans out too. I've got some tomato paste and a little salt and pepper. All right. I've stirred everything in. I'll pop a lid on this. These beans are going into a 275 degree oven for about 40 minutes. While these beans were in the oven, they retained their shape while becoming more tender. It's really concentrated in flavor. It's gotten a little darker, a little thicker, a little richer. Just two final additions. I've got a little red wine vinegar and a little parsley. That vinegar is just gonna brighten that braising liquid up, kind of give it a little kick. And the parsley brings a nice fresh greenness. I can't wait to taste this. These are not your grandmother's green beans, unless they are, in which case, lucky you. They're tender and silky, and each bite is a little bit juicy from the braising liquid that's worked its way in. They're no longer green beans with a tomato sauce. They've become their own dish, and it's magical. So overcooking has helped these green beans to really absorb a new flavor. But you can also overcook vegetables to totally transform their flavor. I've got Andrea Geary's broccoli and cheese soup, and this soup isn't like your typical broccoli and cheese soups. The broccoli flavor comes first in a really great way. To start, I've got some melted butter in this pot, some onion, and a couple of flavorings, some mustard powder, garlic, salt, and pepper. I'm gonna get all of my broccoli in. What I want to happen is for the broccoli cells to start to break down. I'm gonna add some water, pop a lid on, and... <coughs> Now that this is covered, I'm gonna let this simmer for about 20 minutes. Here's the thing, this broccoli could be pureed into a soup after maybe just eight minutes of cooking, and we're not gonna do that. We're gonna let this go a lot longer. The reason for that, I want the isothiocyanates to break down and leave. I want them to perfume the kitchen because if I'm smelling it here, I won't be tasting them in the soup later. All right, it's been 20 minutes and this broccoli has kind of turned to mush, but in a good way, in a really great way. I'm gonna get the rest of the broth and water in. Turn the heat up. This smells amazing. I'm getting this delicate, nutty sweetness, and that's exactly what I want for my soup. On the other hand, what I don't want is this color. That longer cook has kind of destroyed a lot of the chlorophyll that makes broccoli green. That's not ideal. We don't want a brownish soup. What we can do, though, is to replace some of that chlorophyll. Now that we're at a simmer, I'm gonna add some spinach. Spinach is chock full of chlorophyll and it's going to brighten the color of our soup. So in order to help that spinach keep its beautiful green chlorophyll, I wanna just wilt it. It takes only a minute. All right, time to blend. I wanna get about half of this soup into the blender. I'm gonna work this in batches. And while it is nice and hot, I'm gonna add our cheese. I've got my cheddar and Parmesan here for my broccoli and cheese soup. It's time to blend. This soup looks and smells amazing. Just one more little ladle. And then I like to finish it off with just a little bit of cracked black pepper. Wow, this is really good. This is really good. This soup is rich and it's nutty. There's not a ton of overt cheddar-y Parmesan flavor. Instead, you get this richness and a little bit of savoriness all in the service of highlighting the broccoli's nutty sweetness, that nutty sweetness that was revealed when we cooked away all of the stinky sulfury compounds. Amazing. When it comes to cooking vegetables, the traditional ways we know and love, they're great. And they include overcooking vegetables. This is something I grew up with and I love. The next time you're cooking vegetables, don't be afraid to take them a little bit further. Try a little tenderness. <laughs> oh. 
How do you like to cook your vegetables? Are there any you like overcooked? Let me know in the comments below. And be sure to head over to cooksillustrated.com for more great recipes and techniques.